So welcome to this not a technology problem. Um, my name's Colin, I work for Engineer Better. We're a consultancy in London, England. We do a lot of work in Europe, but have also done work in the States, Canada, and I was in Singapore last year. Uh, we do general consultancy around Cloud Foundry, Concourse, digital transformation, Kubernetes a bit now, training delivery, really a mixed bag. Personally, I spend a lot of my time doing uh, deployment, management, automation, operations of Cloud Foundry and helping customers do that. Um, I've been working with Cloud Foundry for about four years now. I was originally an application developer and then I moved into the ops side. Um, so I mostly do delivery of dojos and health checks, staff augmentation, and we deliver training as well. And in working with lots of different customers, I've found that lots of times the questions we get asked fall into similar categories. Every customer has a diverse set of problems, but they all kind of distill down to similar things. So an alternative title for this talk is things customers keep asking me on engagements. Um, so in general, the broad problems that customers seem to face fall into the categories of Cloud Foundry is difficult to operate, our platform's unreliable, and why hasn't Cloud Foundry or any technology we've bought made us more agile? Um, so my response to most of these starts off with, this is not a technology problem. So I'm gonna try and go through common symptoms of the problems, and then causes from my experience, things that are causing these to be problems, and then some solutions that I've seen work at companies that I've worked at. So without further ado, launching into it, we've got Cloud Foundry is difficult to operate. There is some truth to this. Cloud Foundry is fairly complicated, but it's not quite as difficult to operate as a lot of people seem to think. Um, so a lot of times this manifests as the platform team doesn't have enough time, they're working lots of overtime, falling behind on updates, and difficulty keeping up with platform feature requests. So you've got updates to Cloud Foundry itself, and you've got updates that people using Cloud Foundry want. So what causes this? Well, most of the time, it's a lack of automation. So it could also be a lack of understanding about existing automation or uh, problems with the implementation. But every customer I've worked with who have complained about the platform team working too many hours, too much overtime, not enough time to do things, have had some kind of problem with their automation setup. And also, no dedicated platform team. So it's really hard to hire people with kind of Cloud Foundry knowledge or pure DevOps or cloud technologies because it's such a wide range of skills that you need. Uh, so a lot of times I see companies pull people from different parts of the business, which is a pretty good strategy. So someone from the databases team and someone from the networking team. But most of the time they still have responsibilities for whatever teams they were seconded from. So I worked with one customer where the platform team was effectively 75% of one person and 50% of another, and they lived in different countries and different time zones. And it didn't quite work as well as they were hoping. Uh, so most of the time, this problem leads to the platform team being CF push as a service. Um, so actually at the, same, at the same company as the previous example, the development teams weren't trusted with any access to production. So they weren't given CF push access, but they also weren't given access to get logs out or to look at events or to see how their app's running or to scale their apps. So the platform team that was already heavily taxed ended up getting ticket after ticket that went along the lines of deploy this app. If it breaks, fix it. When you don't know how to fix it because you didn't write the app, then join a WebEx call and kind of funnel logs through to the developers and then type into the console what they tell you. Um, what does this have to do with running a reliable platform? Well, nothing. Uh, Cloud Foundry needs to be developed in its own right. It isn't something that just exists and then will work forever. Um, and the final cause is cutting corners on training. I see this a lot at the start of dojos. You have uh, the 
mindset of we really want to get going now. We've got, we bought Cloud Foundry, we want to get going. We'll train up as we go. How hard could it be? Well, there's a thing called Bosch that you need to control it, and it's got a fairly legendary uh, learning curve. Cloud Foundry is a complex distributed system, so you have complex tooling to, uh, to manage it. Um, so kind of trying to learn as you go, rather than putting in the time at the start, doesn't always pay off. But there are some things you can do to set yourself up for success. And the primary one is, if you're still deploying Cloud Foundry manually, you are objectively doing it wrong. And, and please stop. Come talk to me afterwards or talk to any of the other companies over in the Foundry on how they're managing their Cloud Foundries and how they're pushing updates out. Uh, yesterday in the keynotes, Chip mentioned that across all Cloud Foundry Foundation projects, there's 137 releases a month on average. Um, if you expect your platform team to keep up with 137 updates a month across all your foundations manually, it's not going to happen. Um, so effectively, you need to change the focus of your team from a team that operates a platform to a team that builds tooling to operate a platform. So a lot of the teams I've been on, we're just building a concourse pipeline like that that manages Cloud Foundry. And the foundation itself is a nice byproduct of the thing that the team is working on. Um, another good approach is treating the platform as a software product. If you consider a case where you have updates and you have production, in the world of application development, is it acceptable for your developers to take those updates and push them directly into production without testing them? Of, of course not. No one would ever sign off on that. But then what about making changes to the platform that the apps are running on? What about we need this build pack in production now, or we need uh, Diego cells to scale, or something like that? That's a lot more acceptable for some reason to push directly into production without testing and without running it through earlier environments. But it really shouldn't be. Applications and the platform they run on should be treated the same. And the first step to treating the platform as a software product is to have a dedicated team looking after the software product that is the platform. So in the old world, you have application developers that make the apps, and you have platform operators or sysadmins that run the platform. They're kind of separated by an organizational divide. So you've got, they're in different departments or different offices, and if one side wants the other to do something, it's bureaucracy and it takes a lot of time. We've all been there. Cloud Foundry allows for a high degree of self-service within development teams where they can manage the full life cycle of their applications. I used to work for a major retailer in the UK, and I was on the team that made the mobile website. And we were pushing our application to Cloud Foundry, and there were five people in our team. We took 60% of traffic to the website. We wrote the app ourselves, we pushed the app ourselves, and we were the on-call support for the app ourselves. And it was beneficial to both sides of the company. It was really empowering for us. And, it was, and the company didn't need a separate team to deploy our stuff. And if you're the one that gets called at 3 in the morning because you pushed a sketchy update at 5 PM on Friday, you're not going to push sketchy updates at 5 PM on Friday. So I think we had five minutes of production downtime in a year and a half. But on the other side, You've got platform operations, but you've also got platform development. You shouldn't expect the platform to work out of the box, whether it be it CF deployment or CF, yeah, CF deployment, used to be CF release, and any vendor provided Cloud Foundry, it won't solve all your problems out of the box. You need to look at what problems you're trying to solve and mold the platform to do what you want. I uh, hear a lot of customers thinking that Cloud Foundry will reach a done state. You install it, and then it's done, and you don't need to develop it anymore. That doesn't really work. So what you want to do, talk to all the people using your platform, figure out what matters to them and what value they're trying to gain, and then take all of that and put it in an ordered backlog. Sort it by what's actually important to the people that are going to use your platform, and put the most important things at the top and have your dedicated team work on those 
So you're always working on what's most important to the people that matter. And while your team is developing and making these things a reality, who's going to be talking to the stakeholders and making sure it's the right stuff to be working on? That's a job for a product manager. And this is not a project manager who sits on the peripheral and sort of manages the day-to-day -day BAU stuff on the team. This is someone who sits with the team, goes to all the meetings with the team, and is part of the team full time, who bridges the gap between the technical side and the stakeholders and the customers and makes sure that what's being developed is what actually delivers value because that's what all of us are here for, at least hopefully. Um, so iterate quickly and check that you're implementing features that people actually want rather than spending lots of time on things that don't really deliver value. And finally, it's not enough to just have a team. The team actually has to work together. Um, I worked with a large government agency in Europe who had created a team where they pulled people from different parts of the business, but it was geographically separated. They were in three different cities across the country, and they had one half-hour meeting a week where they would talk to each other about what they were doing in the platform. End result was one person had pretty good knowledge of Bosch and pretty good knowledge of how the platform worked, and the rest of the team didn't. It's all well and good while that person's there, but what if they go on holiday, leave the company, get hit by a bus? You often hear this phrase, just the bus factor. Well, then the platform team can't manage the platform, and all that learning that person has done needs to be done again. You can solve this through pairing and mobbing. So pairing, two people, one computer, working on one story. Before you discount it and say that won't work in our industry, I've seen this work with financial companies, large banks, energy companies, security companies. Give it a shot, it works really well. And it means even though someone on your team came from the network team and they're your subject matter expert, if they pair with everyone else on your team over time, everyone becomes knowledgeable about networking. Same goes for everything else. Mobbing also works. Three to five people on one machine. Works for introducing new concepts. And if you want to know more about mobbing, look up the video for my talk at CF Summit Europe in October. So going to the next misunderstanding, because this one isn't really true. Our platform is unreliable. Cloud Foundry is very reliable. In fact, I've seen Cloud Foundry foundations continue to serve traffic even as the underlying IaaS and storage melts into oblivion. Um, we had a situation where the storage on the, uh, on the IaaS was being broken by another team. Cloud Foundry continued to serve application traffic without missing a beat for about four hours. But this usually manifests, and the reason people tell me this, you see downtime during upgrades, you see downtime when you're not changing anything, uh, the same issues keep reoccurring, and successful staging deploys, be it of applications or of the platform itself, lead to unsuccessful production deploys. Um, as mentioned before, most of the time this is with platform upgrades being tested in production or staging. So from the from the platform team perspective, the pre-production environment is production because the application developers are disrupted if it goes down. I worked with a company in Europe that was running no sandbox for financial reasons and only stood up their production foundation right before they had a contractual obligation to deploy applications to it, and it didn't work. And it was pretty stressful. Firewall rules were different. Um, some of you maybe went to the zero to hero training at the start of the summit. This is a really good way to go from zero to a severity zero incident as quickly as possible. Um, another cause, somewhat self-explanatory, past incidents are not documented. So you have an incident, you solve it, you forget about it, pretend it didn't happen, same thing happens the next month, someone else is on call, Maybe they remember something happening, but no one seems to know how to fix it, so you have to do the discovery all over again. 
Uh, Snowflaked environments are another big one. This usually stems from automation problems, as mentioned before. So you deploy your sandbox manually, tweak some things so it works. Deploy your production manually, tweak some things so it works. You deploy your app to pre-production. Everything's great. All right, cool. We deploy it to production. Something's different. Doesn't work. Why is Cloud Foundry so unreliable? Well, maybe it's not Cloud Foundry. And another one's big batch releases. You see this a lot in big companies with big governance models where there's fear of failure. So rather than pushing small updates through frequently, the view is an update will cause downtime. So we should do as few updates as possible and put a month's worth of changes in and just deploy that. That's a really good way to guarantee there's going to be a problem with the deploy. Especially on the operations side of Cloud Foundry, rollbacks aren't really a thing. So if you get partway through a platform upgrade, it, can, it ranges from challenging to almost impossible to roll back to where you were initially. But the general approach is to fix forward. If you have a month's worth of changes and thousands of lines of code in an update, it's going to be really hard to figure out what broke to fix forward. If you made one change and pushed it through, it's almost trivial to figure out how to fix it. So solutions. Have a sandbox environment. Updates in complex systems like Cloud Foundry will break on occasion. You can't avoid it. So make it so the first time you try something is in an environment where failures have no impact on users. Give the platform team somewhere to test changes before they put them somewhere where it actually matters. Um, and with your sandbox environment, you can then set up a system of environment promotion and continuous delivery. So you take your automation and you take your sandbox environment and you deploy using a certain set of inputs. And then you test that it's good to go and it fits your purpose. Then you take the same set of inputs and use the same automation and deploy to pre-production and test that it's fit for purpose. And now you've deployed twice and it's been fit for purpose both times and you deployed with the same mechanism, you should be fully confident it's going to work in production. So you deploy it and you test that it's fit for purpose. Ideally, the arrows in this diagram are automatic. There's no manual gates. Because if you get to production and it doesn't work, it means you need to fix your tests. If this isn't possible for you, for some, or at least currently, for some governance reason, or it's too much change too quickly, see if you can automate some of the governance or the overhead that's making these changes slow. Um, next up, we have document causes and solutions to incidents. So you have a problem in production. Fix it as quickly as possible, sure. But then sit down, look at what caused it. Look at the solution that you implemented. And when you're looking at causes, make sure you're looking at it in terms of process and not in terms of personal failure. So say there was a problem because someone accidentally deleted the production database. The problem isn't that that person deleted the production database. The problem is that it's possible for someone to accidentally delete the production database. So look at fixing that and document it. And once you've documented it, Write some tests for it. And these can be both automated tests in your deployment pipeline and also game days. One of my colleagues ran a game day for uh, the UK government last week where they took a foundation that no one was using and intentionally broke it in devious ways and had the operations team try to figure out how to fix it as if it was a production incident. Um, I also worked with a large bank where we developed a test suite th that went after every deploy with their every deploy with their automation. We ran a test suite which checked every failure case they'd ever had with Cloud Foundry in the last three years. So this caught regressions in the product. It caught regressions in our code. It caught underlying IaaS problems, and it was really valuable. Um, and the crux of it is that failure-free operation requires fit experience with failure. So expe expose your team to failure rather than trying to shield them from it, because that will lead to their ability and improve their ability 
to handle failure when it occurs, because it will occur. And this brings me into the last section, which is a little bit more nebulous. It's not a clear-cut thing, but most of the marketing materials for things like Cloud Foundry and the vendor versions of it talk a lot about speeding up workflows, transforming your business. Cloud Foundry absolutely does this, and all the evidence you need is in the other talks and all the keynotes. But it can't solve everything by itself. So a lot of times I hear, we've deployed Cloud Foundry, but our releases are still big. Our deployment processes are still slow. Feature life cycles are still measured in months, and applications haven't moved over to it, and many other things like this. The crux of it is that digital transformation requires total organizational commitment. So if the mindset of the organization, organization as a whole doesn't change, the transformation won't stick. Uh, in Abby's keynote on Tuesday, she mentioned that technology is the easy part and change is the hard part. So the real underlying problem here is changing from this is the way we've always done it to this is what we need to do to succeed. So I'll leave you with a quote from Chip Childers from a recent Computer Weekly article. Ultimately, you can't buy DevOps. So adopting a DevOps approach or a agile digital transformation approach is all about changing culture. Choosing the technology and the tools and the products that make sense given whatever you're trying to achieve at your company and spend all of the time on choosing the right approach rather than latching on to whatever cool technology you last saw in Hacker News or in, in the news. So the tool and technologies that you need to achieve transformation will become apparent once everyone's oriented towards the same goal. And with that, does anyone have questions? Yep. So you had mentioned about digital transformation requires total organization. Yep. I'm assuming that you don't mean, I'm assuming. Okay. Anyway, I can talk about it. Cool. Um, I'm assuming that means more than just your IT and development organization. I'm assuming that means the business as well, all of your business stakeholders. Yeah, so I don't know if the mic, I don't know if Mike picked that up, but it's. Uh, total organizational commitment requires more than just the IT teams. And yeah, listening to some of the keynotes today on, on the parts that I caught, it, yeah, it's, so it's the company as a whole needs to embrace it. So I was working with a bank recently where they were trying, they were trying to operate in a really agile way, but the higher powers that be still required uh, 90 day plans and sprint planning and everything. It was really hard to meld what they were trying to do in technology with what the bank as a whole wanted to do. So it is about trying to change perceptions of in the old world where you roll back changes and uh, kind of operate in a really waterfall kind of way, trying to show that operating in this new way delivers value and operating in this new way solves the problems that you were trying to solve with the old framework, but also provides more value. So it's trying to project that upwards, which is the challenge always. Yep. So, so I swear you were watching our company before you made this. We seriously feel that way. Yeah, so it's that's true. Different parts of the company change at different speeds, and it's it's trying to trying to make the culture expand out of your team. If you have a team that's doing really well, try to share it. So something we've done before at uh, clients is uh, so you have your platform team and you have application teams, and try to find people in the application teams that are 
kind of interested in the ops side of things and rotate them into the platform team. Maybe rotate someone from the platform team into the development teams. And that kind of bridges understanding between them. And that at least helps figure out the like application dev, application ops, and the platform dev, platform ops thing. But then solving it going outside of technology, it's even harder. Unfortunately, product managers are fairly rare in teams, even the ones that I've seen. So this is almost a call to, almost a call to action that even teams that I work with, it, we have a lot of trouble convert or convincing the company that a product manager is valuable because it's not part of the engineering pool. But in a way, they deliver more value than adding another engineer. So this is where uh, this is where the organizational change then comes in. It's it is hard to do that. Mm -hmm. So the teams that I've seen that work really well, maybe they've changed the reporting structure entirely, or they've made like shadow reporting structures where everyone on the platform team is the same role, effectively a platform engineer, and they all report to a central project manager or product owner, or at least appear to report to them. Um, and that way it consolidates everything in. Uh, anyone else? And, uh, that's some of my sources. The slides are uploaded, so don't worry about taking photos. I guess I could throw in that I, I learned all of this because I go in and pair with customers. Did you see a flat? No. Try it now. Oh, hey, there we go. Now it works. Um, did you see a flattening of pay scales between? So, like, at least at our company, the ops team is not paid as much as our developers, and um, because it's just they're different skill sets. Um, did you did you see any sort of flattening of pay or you know or or career tracks? I can't comment on pay because I go in on the engineering level, not the levels above it. Um, we do see a lot of ops people getting more interested in the developer side and trying to learn the development tools. And I've also seen developers get more interested in the ops side. Like I started as a developer and moved into the ops side, but the first case is much more common. Um, so in terms of skill melding, definitely. I have no idea about pay structure. One thing you had there was uh, use of sandbox yep. as platform. One of the things that I think um, organizations forget about is that your the platform supports the developers and has a whole bunch of customers there. You take the platform out for an upgrade, you've killed development. Yeah. So you have to do it in a non-customer facing thing, which everybody else has, is dev. But for you as platform, yeah, it's something else. So as platform, dev and production are production. So any change to dev is a change to production. So you, you need somewhere that isn't either of those to test things on the platform level. Um, I believe. Anything else? 
Great. Thanks, Colin. Thank you.